Hi everybody, DK with Mr. V Amps here, and today we're going to embark on another project. Um, this is going to be an amplifier build. This kit that we're looking at is a Weber 6V30. V is V30 should be the key as to what amplifier it's based on, and it would be a 60s model. So this is a sort of a period correctish kind of reproduction amplifier. But of course they didn't make it in electric blue. That was my choice. And uh, holy moly is this thing going to be heavy because with two 12 inch speakers in there they're already a little hefty. And then just add the weight of that power transformer. Good grief. But that's how we like it. So the chassis is uh, a multi-part there. We're going to just start by putting things together. We'll get our diagram and pick up the tools and make up the rules. Um, I have not built this kit before, so I might have a few little head scratchers along the way. And we're going to hope that everything's in there. They generally have a good knack of giving us uh, the parts, at least 97% of them. Once in a while we, we miss a resistor or a capacitor. But for the most part, I think they've been doing okay. So let's get started. Okay, so if you've ever, never done one of these kits before, that's perfectly all right. I might suggest starting with a different one because step one is print out your schematic and your layout diagram. And step two is figure it out. That's about it. Um, so again, not Having ever worked on an original one of these, I've worked on a few of the later repros. I had an idea of how the chassis was supposed to go together based on that hand-wired one we did a while back. Um, so this is a two-layer chassis. So essentially we would fold our piece of paper like that. And then this would be the top chassis, what would go in there. And then this would be in the bottom chassis, what goes there. You following me? Lower tube sockets down there, and uh, <clears throat> cap can's going to go over there, right? So cap can, power tubes, and then this would be the rectifier, which was drawn a little off there. I'm going to guess they revised this at a later time. Um, that seems okay. And some of the things may have moved around a little bit, like this looks like the bolts for the choke. So, again, they may have moved a little bit, but uh, not too far. Or maybe the bolts for the choke. Again, we're going to figure all of this out as we go. The, um, <clears throat> let's see, well, by the looks of it, actually, power transformer would be over here and output transformer would be over there. Am I right? Or am I backwards? We'll figure it out. Okay, so step one for me was just to figure out how the chassis kind of goes together. We have <clears throat> these two pieces, uh, put them together with bolts, and then on our diagram I can see a couple of places where wires are supposed to pass through and I put the rubber grommets in there. I put them a few other places too and then I decided maybe I don't need them there. If I need to, there are still more. There are still some more grommets we can put in there when we need them. Um, yeah, so got the two chassis pieces together. I think the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to bolt the tube sockets into place. Okay, <clears throat> and now we have tube sockets. <clears throat> now this is a diagram looking at the bottom. So let's actually flip things over so we're looking at them at the correct angle. Okay. Rectifier tube, power tubes, ding, 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 right? Then our cap's going to go there. And then up on the top side, the way the holes were drilled, we have our our pin ones on our diagram are up up a little bit more. They're down a little bit more here, but again, bing, 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 there we go. So we have room to mount a board up here, down here, 
this is looking fairly close to the diagram and that's what we want to kind of keep with. There's always going to be a few little differences and anomalies and whatnots that we have to deal with but that's okay. Let's go get our let's go get uh, the transformers see how they fit in here. Okay so I'd say that went pretty well. Our power transformer is an absolute beast that is a beefier power transformer, I swear, that's even on, like, the 80-watt um, twin-style amp. Okay, I mean, this thing is just physically massive. It's huge. Um, but, I mean, I, I imagine the filament winding has to be big to handle all of these tubes. Um, choke, output transformer. And on the power transformer, the one leg here, just like on the diagram, we put the tab, the solder tab. So, so far we're sticking to the diagram, and we're going to move forward. Um, there is a cap holster here for the can cap. May stick that in now. Oh, second thing I noticed is there was, underneath the rectifier tube socket here, there was a... Um, terminal strip that goes on one of the bolts so I dug that out and attached that so that's about where we're at we haven't missed anything I'll keep you informed as we move along okay so one more little miniature step um, I added the bracket for the can cap here next to the choke so I think our major hardware is already in so I'm happy with that um, now I think I'm gonna start uh, preparing our boards. Okay, so we're going to start with the small board here. Um, it should be pretty straightforward. This is all resistors and you just basically follow the pattern. You can see where they are connected together. Here across the top you can see the lines where it shows the connections together. And there's one lead that is going to go to a little grounding point over there and one that's going to go to a little grounding point over there. So we need to make sure that we observe that. Um, the resistors marked here, they will have the value and sometimes they might have a dash 2. If it's a dash 2 it's going to be a 2 watt resistor, a little bit beefier resistor. But uh, basically we're going to make this board and when we make it we're going to you know, like fully solder the front here except for the corner, but I'm going to try to tack solder a lot of these because I need to be able to come back and add the wires at a later time. So we're going to, you know, put the components in, secure them so they're not going to fall out, but we're going to leave some of the hole open so we can add wire in the future. So I noticed on our board that we have, we have one extra pair of holes than we did in the on the picture, but uh, that's okay. So we've got the resistors in there, and now we solder. And since I haven't been putting the obligatory solder smoke on any of my videos lately, let's uh, get this done. Let's get some solder smoke going here. See, this one is not a full because I still need to put something in there, so that's a tack. And uh, the remainder of these are going to be tacks, where I just put just enough solder on there to keep the component from going out of the way, falling off. So I can put some wires in and then fill the holes afterwards. That one's not participating. Give me a there we go.
And of course when we're done and we get the wire and everything in here we are going to fully um, fill the eyelet with solder for great contact. At this point we're just trying to get the component to attach to the eyelet so it doesn't fall out. And we still have the eyelet open enough that we can add some wire to it soon. Okay, and now we're going to do some clipping on the back, make it pretty, and uh, move on to the next step. Okay, so I put my board in. Um, as you can see, I ran my uh, corners there, as in the diagram. You run your little corner, you run a wire to the ground there. We will be grounding a few other things there. But because that's a ground point, <clears throat> there's a metal standoff and a bolt on each side. Um, that needs to be very, very, very tight. There's one on both sides. Okay. And as you can see, this is going to be the cathode resistor for the power tubes grounded over here. And then there is a capacitor on this one. So. That'll come later when we get to wiring up the tubes, but you can see why I left those <coughs> holes available for putting wires in, because those are going to go to our various tubes. I opted to use the black wire in their diagram. Zuh. They used black wire as the uh, color of the grounds. Um, the kit does not include that color wire. It includes some other color wires. But uh, I just thought black would make sense, so that's what I did. All right, let's make another board. Okay, so happy next day. Um, I wired up my first board, which is this board on the diagram. Um, pretty straightforward. If you notice all of these little red arrows, these are all grounds that go to the brass plate. So I have used the leads from the components. They should reach because this board snuffs right up against there. Um, so that's cool. There's a few lettered connection points. A, D, C, and B are all down here in the power section. And then there's also X and Y which are in the output area over here. So we'll be tying those in at a later time. There is a point P here, P is in Paul, and that is from there to there. And if you notice, there are some dotted lines which are connections under the board. Short connections under the board, I, this is the one for the P letter there, but short connections that went under the board, I just uh, J-hook some leads together, or if the component leads were really long, we just were able to do that. Now this is going to sit on you know on a, uh, a riser standoff there you go so that's going to be up off the board a little bit um, if you are concerned about it you can obviously cover the back with electrical tape but we have some more things to add um, as far as the electrolytic capacitors there's some 0.25s the positive is going to face this way so the you know towards towards me that way um, so that's going to be the end with the dimple um, dimpled ridge, there's uh, I believe three of them, are there not, or are there two, or are there three? I swear there were two, no, there's two. Is there a third one? My brain tells me there was a third one, but that's probably just deceiving me at the moment. No, there is a third one. Yeah, there is. One, two is hiding right there, and there's three. So these are 25s, and then this is a 40 microfarad. Um, that is full high voltage there, uh, so it's beefy. I don't know that it needs to be that voltage. I don't know what the original was, I'll be honest with you. Um, and then the second thing I did is, is the components here. I swept them outward so I could still access the screw hole, and I did the same on the far side. So um, more or less pretty much just following the diagrams here. Um, and then before we screw this board down, what we shall do is we will get the power supply together 
and get the leads on here to go to points X, Y, B, C, and D, and A, and all of that. Um, so that's good for this board. As far as reading these caps, it's easy to confuse. You have point 047, which is 473. Uh, you have the um, point 022, which is uh, 223. And then there is point 0047, which would be marked as 472. And then there is uh, point 0.1, which is 104, and 0.01, which is 103. So if you're not familiar with reading these tubular capacitors, that's the that's the codage on them. Um, and it's easy to goof them up, you know. And as far as the resistors go, some of them are the three-band, four-band, five-band, whatever. So if anything, you know, use your color chart to get the right idea. And then once you've sorted out the few that you think are the right ones that go in there, you know, check them with your meter. It's okay. It won't hurt. Um, capacitors and stuff too. You know, if you're if you're ever iffy on it, just check it first. It's easier to check it now than it is to desolder it and curse the sky a little bit later. Okay, so I put this lower board together. That's this one down here. This is the, the this one's. There's a lot of. There are a lot of connections that run underneath the board that are represented with dotted lines and you have your ground bus represented in black. These are mission critical and this to work and I mean there are a lot of connections beneath the board. Those can be accomplished by either J-hooking components together underneath there if they're you know far enough away that they're not going to touch or you can run a wire as I've done in many of these cases. The yellow wires represent the connections where the black wire represents the ground connections. And uh, there is a lot of room to goof here. There is a lot of chance to goof. I made two goofs here while I was working. Um, the point one capacitor is going to be 104J the point zero one capacitor is one zero three J, and then there's a point zero zero two, which is two 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 K, is what that one's listed as, and then we have you know our pico farad size capacitors in there. These are fairly well labeled with their value, so no issue there. Um, again, two uh, small electrolytics here. Make sure that they're facing the. Um, you don't have the negative facing the ground, which is, again, another goof that I need to cor correct because I can see, again, the other board, this board, the electrolytics, ground is that way toward the top, so you put the negatives that way. In this case, the ground is running along the bottom here, so the negatives need to go that way. And, again, after doing this, Take your meter on beep mode, test from point to point to point to check all of your underneath connections. Double check your values, you know, once you get it together, just take the time, double check your resistor values, and then nothing is going to go kablam. And again, just by looking at this and evaluating it quickly, I just caught that I made a boo-boo. It's a not a detrimental uh, end of the world kind of thing. I can correct it quickly and it avoided issue. I had already checked it twice and now we're checking it thrice and we're going to get it. Now if this was Bob Ross's channel we would have had a happy accident. Um, but it was easily correctable. What I didn't catch is the holes in this circuit board are drilled symmetrically to the center of the board. On this board they are not. So I didn't dry fit the board to the studs beforehand. And I realized when I did the board would be too far forward covering the tube sockets. So I had to redrill the holes in the fiber board a little bit off from where they were to correct my boo-boo. The kit was correct. I was a goof. So my choices were to redrill the holes or flip every one of these components back around. I think for time's sake we'll just drill the holes.
Okay, so we're at the next day. I'm going to catch you up before I keep going here. Um, I started doing the power rails, and up on the top board there is A. And that's the only A that I see on here. That doesn't mean there aren't more, but that's the only one I see. I also, in double-checking, realized that there's a connection Z, or Z if you're in the UK, that goes behind the second board. Again, kind of missed that. That's okay. We'll get it. The second thing, too, is you'll see we have points C and D. Point D is only up here, and point C is all across here. So I'm going to need to construct a rail across the back of this board for the power rail C. A is down here at the can cap, um, which, again, the can cap in the picture, it's, you know, pictured sort of vertically. You got to rotate it 45 degrees to get the reality. But we're making progress. So I have a line running this red line, zip, 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 up there and underneath to uh, the A spot there on the top board, which I have the boards. Uh, the board is detached, so I can just flip it and work on it. But it does have the A rail is connected. Um, so I'm going to also need to do. The D rail would be the most logical next step. Uh, secondarily, the terminal strip here, I found I had to drill the hole a little bit bigger in the terminal strip to make it fit on the choke bolt. And this negative of this cap is a ground, so even if it touches the bolt, nothing bad's going to happen. Um, the main lead of the cap here actually goes across. These are all three bridged across there on this 20 microfarad cap. So I just bridged it right across there, um, and I have my first 22K 2-watt resistor, the big wide one. So again, progress. I'm just trying to follow the diagram. The other thing that I noticed in hooking up the choke, because the choke goes one to point number one over here, and then the other one to the end of the terminal strip. So bing, bing, it's there. When we hook up the red lead from the output transformer to point number one, right there that's fine but then we need to hook the blue and the black wires to the it has them listed as the outside pins of our power tubes but the blue lead is not long enough to reach all the way to the outside power tube but if you look there's a bridge you know because this is a push pull two on a side there's a bridge here between pin seven on this set of tubes and a bridge between pins seven on this pair of tubes so it would make sense that I could just move the lead from here to there and it would electrically be the same. So that's what I did. I moved the output transformers leads from the outside pair of tubes to the inside just due to wire length. That should not have any electrical effect on it. All right, I'll catch up with you after I take my stupid phone call. Okay, and we're back. I had a nice conversation with a local uh, business who's looking for somebody who makes pedals locally. Hmm, I perchance to know somebody who does that. Okay, so the front board, I have it screwed back down because I have made all of the connections. Uh, a is connected to the A rail. Uh, D is connected to the D rail. F, or I'm sorry, P is in Peter as a jumper behind the board. C rail is also connected down here. So I have the C just on that yellow wire there awaiting to be connected. Um, and then B rail is the uh, red wire that's uh, going loop, loop, down there, the B rail down there. And then there's also connections X and Y which are to the little board down there by the power tubes and that would be the yellow and blue wire respectively I'm going to points X and Y. Now there is only one wire that actually drops behind this board and it's gonna pinch. It's the one for the brilliant volume that is gonna pinch in there so I slipped it in place right now because it's a little tricky. It would be very difficult to get it in there later, so I hooked up that particular one now. Um, the remainder of those will all be done from the top of the board, and I have all of these ground points to solder, so that's the next plan. So we're heating up the 
big mamma jamma over there, the 80 watt soldering iron. If I was Terry at D-Lab, I would be playing this Nazaramus theme. Okay, so for positioning's sake, I have a pot and the jack in there just to put the brass plate in the right place. And I got those soldered, the grounds all soldered down to the board. Um, how do you know that you've done a good job? Well, first of all, this brass kind of usually has kind of an oil on it or it gets corrosion or something, so you don't want to take your razor knife and scrape a clean surface or get a rotary tool and grind a clean surface, whatever. It needs to be a roughed surface. And then however much heat you think you need as far as a uh, soldering iron, uh, get more. <laughs> the more heat, the more better. And uh, obviously, how do you know you've got a good solder joint when you can't pop it off of there with your fingers or a screwdriver or something? I mean, after you put these down, try and pop them. Try and pop them off of there and see if, if they don't pop off, then you know you got it. If you can pop them off, you got to do it again. Okay, so I've hooked up power rail C onto the yellow wire, which comes around to right there and then it's got you can probably see maybe the yellow wire that comes over to the other two points there and then the yellow wire that's coming through up to here to give power C to the board there because we have C C C C so there we go um, progress is happening only one thing that's going to mildly annoy me is there's a one and a half K resistor to ground here up on this tube and uh, I didn't catch it. I want to try to put that on a ground lug and see how it does and uh, if I have to I'll reroute it somewhere else. Okay so I got going on the input jacks. Um, the advice you get in your diagram is that uh, on three of them there's a one meg resistor between switch and ground and on the bottom switch is just tied to ground and then you have all the 68k resistors which we haven't got to that point yet but this is a plastic cliff jack the body of the plastic jack does not ground to the chassis like a switchcraft does in your US style amps so what we did is the ground is the middle on all of these uh, little boards and the switches on the right so you can see on the top row there I have the one meg resistor going from switch to ground and then the ground is connected from bottom to top and then onto our little matrix to take it to the brass plate for ground I don't know if that's the way the originals were done but it's the way I did it and it should work Electrically, it makes sense. Okay, so I finished connecting the input jacks to the respective tubes. And I haven't messed with the vibrato tremolo pots yet, but I put the remainder of the pots in and I wired them up. So, again, just trying to follow the diagram, being very careful. Um, a couple things that are my style. Um, when you see a pot that shows, you know, one of the rails to ground, I've seen some guys that'll bend it down and solder it to the pot's back. I like to use a little component lead, you know, just put a little component lead there. In this case, the shield from the shielded wire did the job. Um, so, yeah, so far things are, things are good. Um, I've used the little beeper, you know, the continuity meter. Um, to check like on my shielded wire that signal is getting from A to B and that the shield is grounded and that I'm going to where I want to go to and nothing that's not supposed to be grounded out is grounded out. Um, you know, so it, it's going okay. I'm um, going to call it for today and keep going later. This is a very, very tedious um, amplifier. I don't know how long this is in video time, but... Uh, I can sit down and just start plugging away at this and, you know, forget to eat and four hours later I'm like, something's wrong. Why am I shaking? And it's because I'm hungry and I've got low bl blood sugar or something. Um, but it's just a matter, on this kind of stuff, once I get working, it's just relaxing and 
Um, it's quiet around here for a change. So and obviously you hear no running water and no stomping on the floors and things like you usually do. So it's a good opportunity to be productive. Um, you know, you know, put your components in. Just again, following the diagram very carefully. So far, everything is going pretty good. Um, next, I'm going to probably go with because the vibrato stuffs. Um, which this pot I haven't stuck in there yet, but because these pots jump over to this area to hook up, um, I think it would make more sense to do the tubes up here first, um, just so I can keep the wires, you know, extra short. And again, I'm, I'm happy with how not jumbled the wires have become. It's very easy to make a big mess, and it's actually very difficult to keep that beautiful... 90 degree pattern that was so common with uh, UK amps that were made by a lot of guys that were former military um, you know a lot of experience but again I'm trying to keep everything neat try to get a relative 90 get some nice little sweeps and keep the wires out of the way so they're not a big flipping disaster and it's working pretty good so I'm happy so far Okay, good evening. We've wired in the last of the reverb tremolo pots and the tubes, except for the filaments. And there's a lot to do here. Very complex. And I can sit here and give zillions of tips and tricks, but I guess I would say just try to figure out what goes under first. Goes under first and tuck that under and then try to put the other stuff on top so you know just looking by the way things go the ones that go the farthest out maybe do first um, tuck them under and then put the next ones up on there you know just do what you can to keep it neat um, one of the things I do with anything that jumps over you can see we have a few of them that jump over um, that is actually a contiguous wire. I didn't cut the wire. I just uh, pulled the insulation back, pushed it through the pin, and then put some more insulation over it. So that's still one contiguous wire on the jumps there. And there's a jump over here also. Um, same deal with uh, like a resistor that does the jump. If the resistor does the jump, like that yellow wire there is actually just a resistor lead with uh, some insulation put on it. So we still have enough room and clearance and things to do the filaments. Um, <laughs> this is a very complex amplifier. And we got these wired in there. Our tremolo and um, our tremolo pots there. Tremolo slash vibrato pots. So yeah, I mean it's coming along um, slowly but surely. Uh, next I'm going to try to uh, come down here and uh, work on we're wiring the power tubes down here and uh, you know one day at a time a little bit a little bit counts each time keep going okay a little bit later in the future and we have wired up the power tubes pretty much according to diagram but we made a few executive decisions like earlier because of the length of the wires of the output transformer getting to the outside tubes was too difficult but as you can see, there's a bridge there and there. So I put them on the inside tubes, and then the bridges, you know, still connect. Second sort of executive ish decision all of the cathodes of the tubes tie together. And somebody apparently wants to talk to me. That was the same spam call I got like 10 minutes ago. I'm about ready to tell them where to go, like it's going to help. Okay, so anyway, since all the cathodes are tied together, uh, you can see they put the capacitor, which is a 250 microfarad, they put that on this inside tube, and they put the um, resistor, which is the 50 or 50 ohm, 10 watt, 15 watt resistor, 10 10 watt, I believe. They put that on this tube, but all of the cathodes are tied together, so it shouldn't matter because electrically it will be the same. So all of our cathodes are tied together here with the yellow wire and there is our capacitor, 250 microfarad, 
and over here is our 200 or our 50 ohm uh, resistor and uh, the reason they're laid out that way is they just fit better because of the, the short leads on the resistor work better over on this tube to get around the corner and the longer leads of this capacitor work better to you know I can sneak it through no problem electrically it's the same physically it's a little different okay then we'll try this again I got the rectifier tube hooked up the yellow is the filament for the 5 volt rectifier it's a um, GZ34 which is a 5 volt tube and then we have the high voltage which would be the red and white striped wire there um, and then coming off of pin 8 you go up to the standby switch which is over there and then you come back to right there which then in turn um, turns and goes over to the filter caps and all that fun stuff down there so that parts in and we are really nearing completion here we need to finish the power supply you know power switch and stuff and we need to do the filaments so I think I'm gonna do the filaments next okay so we grounded the green yellow stripe because that's the center tap of the filaments right and the green pair is the filaments I go up here to this terminal strip and then they come down and go to each of the power tubes and then see I got another pair going up through there and that pair feeds the pilot light and the preamp tubes and uh, again it's all according to diagram 12A whatever seven tubes are a little tricky because both pins uh, 5, 6, yeah, it's 5, 6, right, yeah, 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 5, 6, are tied together, so that's a little tricky sometimes to do, um, and of course you're going from tube to tube to tube, so it's a lot of wire, it's a lot of mess, some amps it makes sense to do it first, some amps it makes sense to do it last, just depends on the layout, and in this case it seemed to make sense to do it after I had already wired all the rest of the stuff into the tubes, boy, there's a lot of work here. Okay, so I put the terminal in over there for the speakers, and I hooked the rest of the power up there, power transformer. They sent me the international power cord, which isn't the uh, white, black, green of the U.S. power cord. It's blue, brown, and yellow with green stripe. So I wrung it out to, with, the, with the beeper to make sure I knew what was what. So, and the hot's coming through there. So it comes in from the wall, goes through the fuse, goes through the power switch, goes back to the transformer through the blue wire, which is 120 volt, allegedly. Or I'm sorry, the brown wire, excuse me, the brown wire is allegedly 120 volt, the blue wire is 220. Sorry, brown, 120. Okay, let's look on our chart. Brown, 120 volts. Okay, good, so we're right, we're right, and uh, then the uh, neutral is connected to the black lead. I soldered it. I didn't just put a screw cap on it. I soldered. It ain't going nowhere. Um, so that's hooked up. Obviously, we hooked up the filaments before. Um, I did put the tremolo vibrato switch on. So logically, we should be able to turn it on and start seeing if things explode. Oh, and we all have to protest because I got shortchanged one knob. Um, actually, these knobs were a little defective to start with. The machining inside was really, really tight on the pots, and where the retention screw went in, which is a little too thin, um, there were some burrs, and they had to be knocked out of there before these would settle down. Not really thrilled with the construction of the knobs. Absolutely love the look. Uh, I know how to correct knobs that won't turn down tight, but we were short one of them, and uh, so I put the white one there. What was interesting is if I had a whole bunch of white ones, doing all three volumes in the white one might have looked really cool, but uh, we'll get another blue one for there. So we're going to plug it in and just turn it on. There's no rectifier tube in there, so nothing bad is going to happen other than the power light's going to come on, and as long as there's no sparks, we're fine. Um, you know, 
no tubes in there. Nothing's really, no tubes and it's going to be on standby. So nothing's going to go kabang, kaboom. And maybe we'll blow a fuse if we have a short. So it's five amp fuse, nothing to worry about. So flip the on switch, there's our on light. No fire, no smoke. And we'll take it off of standby. This is going to throw high voltage to the remainder of the circuit. So if we had, you know, actually this isn't going to do squat because there's no rectifier tube. See, didn't do squat. But that's okay. So let's go get our rectifier tube and try again. Okay, so we're back on again and our GZ35 rectifier is uh, glowing. It, you can't tell because it's a silver top, but I looked and it's glowing. And it's had a minute to warm up, so if I take it off a of standby, I should get high voltage. This is where we'll get some explosions, maybe. And again, nothing. So, no fuse blown, no nothing. Good enough. Let's go get some other tubes. Okay, so for science, we have the um, test speaker hooked up there. It's an 8 ohm speaker, so I've got it on the 8 ohm tap there with just some gator clips. And we have the amplifier in the on position. And our tubes are illuminating. We have JJ's in there set for one Sylvania. It's a little hard to see those. I changed the shop lights to LED so they're bright. See what I get for that? Yep, we got illumination in all of them. So our filament wires are good. Now I guess we just flip standby off and see if it explodes. I checked my wiring about 50 times, so I think this is probably going to be fine. Okay, so taking it off of standby gave us a little tiny thump and I'm not hearing noise and I'm not seeing smoke and our transformer is cold as ice and our choke is yeah so far nothing interesting happened so I suppose we should plug something in the input jack and see if it makes any noise because if it does that then we're in good shape and if it doesn't do that then we have issues okay so let's start with the abnormal channel. I already hear a little bit coming through. Oh yeah, okay, so normal channel works. Let's turn the treble down. Yeah. And then all the way up. That seems to work. Let's check top. Oh yeah, tone cut rolls treble off for sure. It's hard to tell if the bass control is doing anything. It's hard to tell, but if I take my finger off the ground and really drive signal into it... Yeah, it's still a little hard to tell if the bass control does anything. We'll find out, I guess, after we plug a guitar into it. And on top of that, it's really hard to hear bass anyway when you have a speaker with no cabinet. Okay, so we verified that the normal channel tries to work. The second input is probably, I think this is the colder input. One of them's the hotter input, one of them's the colder. I think I can hear the bass a little bit more on the colder one, but all right, let's check the brilliant channel. See if it's really brilliant or not. I can tell the bass is working on the brilliant channel, like big league. And again, not not remarkably familiar with the way these amps are stock. I can tell for sure the tone controls are working for the 
for the normal channel, so they or for the brilliant channel, so they may very well be working for the normal channel too. And of course the normal channel is gonna be bright as bright as day with yeah. But that cuts, but yeah. Our channel's all highs, so that's fine. So far so good. And yeah, that whistling and singing, everybody goes, that's something wrong. I can't, I find amps do that all the time. I must have magic electricity in my fingers to make them whistle like that, because they just do that for me. All right, Viber Trem channel. Oh, it makes noise, and I can hear vibrato. Okay, it's vibratoing. And the speed works. That seems shallow, and that should be deeper. And that turns it off, and that turns it on. Okay, so that part's working, and then if I, is it pull for tremolo? Yep. So we should have a lot of depth. Squeak, squeak, squeak. Turn that. Yeah, shallow, very intense, and then speed, slowest to really fast. And it seems like we got a little bit of fizz at the end of our pot, because our speed does funky things at the top end. Got a little bit of dirt in that pot. Cool. So, what can I say? I think we've got another successful amp. First time fired up, it just wants to work. Um, I know that that goes against what all of the other amp technicians on YouTube would tell you. They're going to have you break out your Variac and do all of this other stuff. Um, I check, I only do that on amps that are known to be problematic. You know, if the thing blew the fuse before and I just changed a bunch of parts that I think are the problem and then I'm creeping them back up, you know, yeah, I'll do that. On something I just built, I'm not the world's greatest amp tech by any means, but I check my diagrams over and over and over and over and over again till I'm blue in the face. And I have, we've experienced four in a row now, this two Smoke and Joe amps, and then the, uh, what the heck is it, the 6A, was it 6A14, I think they call it, which is the 60s Princeton style reverb thing. And again, out of the box, they were ready to rock. And is it because I'm an amazing magic technician? Uh, no. It's just because I was that darn meticulous in building it that it just worked the first time. So, um, yeah, I guess we can put it in the cabinet, see how it sounds, get ourselves a knob, maybe do some tweaking in the future, but our uh, foot switch turns on, the, turns on and off the vibe and trim, which is what we want, and all three channels work, and the tone controls appear to work. Um, I can hear them particularly well on both Vibe Trim and Brilliant, but not so much on Normal. But uh, that's that could just be a function of me just listening to noise from my finger. Um, so we'll get our speakers wired up and get this in a cabinet. And see what happens when you read your schematic, kids. You figure out what you didn't know before. Watch our normal input. We come in, we go through the first 12AX7, outer volume knob, do do do, into another 12AX, and uh, we actually feed these two, and uh, we end up over here at our tone cut. But our bright input goes through 12AX. Out of its volume, it goes up to the bass and treble circuit. So the bass and treble um, 
knobs not seeming to do anything on the normal channel now makes sense. Huh. Okay, so here we go. We're on the magical brilliant channel and the low gain input at about 5% volume. Good holy moly is this thing loud. too loud for our poor camera so apologies in advance um, the normal channel sounds pretty much like a normal channel it probably make a good pedal platform it's definitely lower gain and uh, yep so tremolo we'll go with the tremolo first I guess just because reasons let's get a little bit of volume there what happened to my volume Did I lose it sounds really cool. It's got a nice organ tone to it. working properly um, you know everything's cool I'm I'm happy um, if I were to fiddle around with anything maybe slowing down the vibrato and tremolo might be a project but the magic in these is is that brilliant channel uh, you can do a ton with it yeah I brought out I broke out the 12 string guitar just because I figured y'all needed to hear it I don't know why just because why you know when you power these things up for the first time Obviously, we had good fortune like we tend to do on this channel because I'm, I try to be very, very thorough and check myself again and again. But, you know, when you turn it on, it might be Meet the Beatles or it might be Beat the Meatles. Who knows? So I did contact uh, the guys at Weber, discussed a little bit about the pluses and the minuses that we had. We're getting... There were a couple of caps that were supposed to be in the kit that were not. They're fixing that. I got them out of my stash, so the amp is complete that way. And we're getting the... The one we're getting the knob replaced, so we'll have all blue knobs rather than the white knob. And I'm sure somebody's going to ask me what speakers are in here, so I will show you in a second. And just so you can see it, these are the 12-inch Weber Alnico Blue Dog speakers. Um, they're they get the uh, UK cones there, and essentially reproduce a very close approximation to the vintage Alnico blue speaker that was associated with these amplifiers. Um, I think they do a good job on speakers. We've used their speakers in a lot of our amp kits and granted I do get a lot of my amp parts and stuff from those guys. Um, I think their speakers are every bit as uh, good as the national brands if not a little bit more and being hand assembled they're always always producing plenty of volume so you can use a smaller, gentler amplifier and really crank the noise. Um, the Silver Bell, which is the other 
Alnico UK style speaker they've got. I've got the 10 inch version of that in uh, both of the Smoke and Joe versions that we used and it was just a bang on great speaker. I'm actually surprised at how much bass this amplifier produces. It's actually a nice rich thick tone. I can easily dial it back and get a thin tone but uh, let's put it this way. This amplifier sounds rich with plenty of bass and plenty of treble. This amp actually sounds brighter with less bass. Granted it's only got one 12 inch speaker but definitely a thinner sound and that one's got a really thin sound so as far as versatility goes I think our new kit amp can produce overall a more rounded sound go get your forklift to move it around so my final thoughts this particular kit is a lot of tedious work to assemble there's a lot of parts a lot of things to do um, and that's okay uh, the cabinet itself and getting the chassis in the cabinet was a little bit of a challenge. There were a few clearance issues and I had a bit of a wrestling match. Um, and it's, we're not talking SD Jones versus King Kong Bundy at WrestleMania 2. That was over in 9 seconds. This was more like a Starcade match between Steamboat and Flair. It went for a long time, but I won. And what's interesting is the guys at Weber will talk to you about different issues that you might have had and they're always looking to improve. Uh, the kits now versus the kits uh, 10, 11 years ago have already seen a number of upgrades. Um, I'm seeing better jacks, uh, better, uh, more precisely done chassis. I've just, I have seen a lot of improvements and I have a lot of fun putting these together. You know, sometimes completely scratch building something is a little more than you want to do but you want to start with a platform and a known entity and this is a great way to produce a clone and quite frankly those speakers put it over the top and I would say right now that this is a lot this will definitely hold a candle if not easily defeat the cream colored hand wired amps that are being shipped under a national brand that are assembled in a sweatshop in Vietnam <coughs> And never mind. All right, thanks for watching, guys. Have a great day. Uh, amp building isn't total rocket sur surgery. You can figure it out. Just uh, take your time, do a good job, and you too can have an awesome amplifier. Have a great day. Oh, yeah, I still got to put a logo on this. It's on order. <laughs>